Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, mine website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz or at Banking Day. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from my website, leongetler.com. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number one in our series for 2024, and today's date is Friday, February the 2nd. First, I'll be talking to Steph Schotts, who led the launch of the Second Nature program in Australia and New Zealand. It's a program that works on WhatsApp, teaming participants up with dietitians and health coaches. And I'll be talking to economist Saul Eslake about the outlook for the economy in the year ahead. But first, let's talk to Steph Schotts. Tell us about uh, Second Nature's Behavioural Change Program. Yes, essentially Second Nature is a holistic lifestyle change program. So it's evidence-based, so we're really trying to move away from fad diets. And it's 100% digital, which means that it's all delivered through an app on your mobile phone. So it's completely on an app. And um, essentially, if it's helpful, I can sort of take you through what the, what the participant journey would be um, for our program. Well, please do so, that. Please do that. Yeah, definitely. So essentially, when you sign up to the program, um, you'll be put into a group. So your group is there, um, almost like your community. So they're all starting the program at the same time as you. And they're there to help support you throughout the program. And then in addition to being assigned a group that um, you're going through the journey with, you'll also be assigned a health coach who is an accredited practicing dietitian. Um, So they are locally based. So in Australia, you will receive an Australian um, APD. Or if you're in the UK, you'd receive a registered dietitian or nutritionist. And they're essentially there to really help guide you and support you throughout the journey. So to be there to answer any questions you might have, provide you with tools that you need to help make the behavior changes to work towards your goals. And yeah, just really be there to support you along the way. And then in addition to that, there's also um, what we like to call the 360 approach. So Typically, a lot of um, diets focus on just nutrition, and typically that also comes down to calorie counting, which unfortunately, as we know, doesn't quite work, it's particularly in the long term. We're not human calculators. So yeah, what we do is we focus on nutrition, so providing some general guidelines that can be personalized to fit in with your lifestyle. And then we also take into account all of the, uh, I guess, areas of your lifestyle that will interplay with your with your lifestyle. So looking at things like sleep, stress, exercise, mindset, um, because as I'm sure you can relate, Leon, when we've had a bad night's sleep, we're more likely to then delve into some more food that we probably typically wouldn't have. We might not feel like exercising and it can have that really big knock-on effect. So just trying to tie them all together and focus on the holistic approach rather than just one area, because we know that typically doesn't allow for sustainable long-term changes. You, you have one coach and dietitian user yeah so uh, the the user will be assigned a health coach or dietitian and they'll be there to support them throughout the whole way Um, and then they also have their group so the dietitian is typically available monday to friday during sort of your your regular hours and yeah they'll be there to answer any questions you have and i guess the model that we've been able to develop means that you're getting a really high amount of support from a dietitian which you typically wouldn't get in, I guess, traditional methods or just going to see a dietitian in person, you know, once a, w- once a week, once a fortnight, once a month. And how do the groups work? So the groups work in that everyone in your group will um, start the same day that you've started. So when you sign up to the program, you select a start date and you'll be placed in people, uh, placed in a group with other people starting at that same time. And if you think of the group chat like a big WhatsApp group chat with your mates, Um, It's very similar in that it's all chat-based. It means that you can check in any time of the day. As long as you've got access to the internet, you can can really access it whenever you need to. Um, And I guess, yeah, like I mentioned before, they're all there to support each other. You're on the same journey, so it can be really nice to sort of have that um, check-in whenever you need it. And it's it's very much much like... uh... What's it? Yeah, yeah. So it's all um, chat based and it will be similar with their health coach and that you can talk to them over similar again, like a WhatsApp group chat um, or iMessage, whatever you want to chat based. In that it's, yeah, it's all written. And then there are opportunities as well to um, have a phone call with your health coach if that's what you need throughout the journey as well. How many people can actually accommodate, be accommodated on this journey at any one time? Well, I guess. 
what we've been able to do is because of how we've um, structured the program, um, in particular, the group chat and um, the health coaching and the fact that we've been able to, I guess, create a really great hiring process. Um, it means that we can scale as we need to and um, continuously have people join the program um, while overcoming a lot of those traditional barriers that you typically have that I guess would reduce the number of people that you can see. I guess uh, COVID would have had quite an impact because people are suddenly much more aware of their health and uh, <laughs> diet and uh, uh, well-being Definitely. and they're also much more isolated as well. <laughs> exactly. so, that, so that would have had quite an impact, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting time um, in that, yeah, people are finding themselves with a completely different lifestyle. They're now at home a lot more than they used to be. And so what we've seen is not only does your health factors impact on your risk of the severity of getting COVID and the severity of having it, of, of, the, of COVID once you have it. Um, and so people, are, I guess, are looking for ways that they can improve their health because it's front of mind for everyone at the moment. But not being able to go, you know, just pop in down to your local doctor person has really changed change how we access healthcare as well. So I guess it's been a great time to have a digital program like ourselves available in that you can do it all from the comfort of your home. You can do it at a time that suits you and make that fit in with the work-life balance, which is ever-changing at the moment as well. So, uh, I mean, do, does this apply for all age groups? I mean, have you had issues with, I mean, I mean would older people go for this as well? <laughs> great question. And I think, um, I think typically we think that the older generation will struggle um, because of the technology um, using a phone. But what we've found that is if they do feel confident using a phone or an iPad, whichever you know works best, they actually have really great outcomes, almost better than other age groups. So I think, yeah, definitely, If as long as you feel comfortable and confident using an app, um, it's very user-friendly, very easy to grasp. It, yeah, I guess there's no major issues, um, but, I guess, yeah, you do have to feel comfortable with using a phone and a smartphone. So there will be people that it's not suited for. Um, but typically we find that there aren't really too many issues. So, well, I mean, you, you've been operating some time in the UK. What's the response been like to, to that in the UK? Yeah, so we've actually had um, some really great success in the UK. So we've been, so the I guess the company started back in 2014. And then in 2017, things started to pick up a fair bit for us. And um, that's where we started to come on board with the NHS. So we've been able to prove ourselves, prove our outcomes to show that we are um, delivering a lot of success, especially in the diabetes space. And so we're now a digital provider um, on the NHS, so the National Health System in the UK, for the National Diabetes Prevention Program. And we also have a number of type 2 diabetes and weight management contracts throughout England as well, which is fantastic. So uh, what sort of accommodation are you making for Australia with this? Sort of towards the end of 2019, launched in Australia and New Zealand. And what we've done here is essentially launch to our, our consumer base. So as you can probably understand, getting contracts into the government can take some time. <laughs> and so at the moment, we're focusing on really delivering a fantastic service and sort of, I guess, confirming the outcomes that we have in the UK with our Australian base. And then, yeah, trying to work with other people to make sure, to see if there's any other ways that we can deliver it in Australia, I guess, similar to the UK model of having both consumers and NHS available, yeah. Well, in the UK, you've worked with NHS. Is there any prospect of you bringing on Medicare in Australia with this? I would love that. <laughs> I would absolutely love to work with Medicare um, because, as we know, it's people also from a lower socioeconomic status that sure. um, often often you know need it the most um, yeah, but that, yeah. yeah it comes with a cost unfortunately the program and so if we can find a way that we can deliver it to the people that meet, need it most um we would absolutely love to do that it's sort of just trying to work with the government work with medicare and see if there's any opportunities there and yeah like i mentioned before it does it does seem to take time um right, sort okay. of connecting through. <laughs> um so yeah that's definitely a goal in mind for us is to to work with medicare as you have the runs on the board with nhs that would go in your favor wouldn't it? yeah i mean we've been able to prove ourselves with um with the national healthcare system which is fantastic and um outcomes it, while that's um, really great and we can translate that to Australia, we also are looking to get some more Australia local-based outcomes um, because I think that's always uh, well-respected when trying to get on board um, 
there's some different programs here. Well, well you'd, you'd probably have to work with uh, local community groups too, wouldn't you? Mm, yeah, so looking at how um, a lot of the funding models and pilot programs sort of traditionally work in Australia is working with the different local PHNs. Um, so in the UK, for us, that would be CCGs that we work with. And so it's quite a similar concept here, working with a, a local PHN. Um, but unfortunately, um, the funding towards preventative care in Australia is very limited. Um, so it's just sort of trying to find the right time and um, getting the right people on board who are very enthusiastic about innovative programs to help change the future. Well, Steph, it's going to be fascinating to watch and thank you very much for your time. Not a problem. Thank you so much for chatting with me. And now let's talk to economist Saul Leslie. Oh, so how do you see the Australian economy growing in 2024? Well, I think it's going to be a year of two halves. The first half is going to be slow, possibly slower than the second half of 2023 was. It's, I think, quite likely that we will have more quarters of negative real per capita GDP growth. We had two of those. In fact, to two decimal places, we had three of them in 2023. And we don't have the December quarter figures yet. We don't get those until the first Wednesday in March. But I think we'll have at least one more in the first quarter of 2024. I don't think we'll have a recession in the sense commonly used in the media of consecutive quarters of negative growth in real GDP itself. But that will be only because of the still very rapid growth in our population, even though the surge in immigration that followed the opening of our borders in early 2022 seems to have peaked as of the end of 2023. Consumers are going to be under continued pressure from rising interest rates and rising taxes, whilst the housing sector is also quite weak, as evidenced by the September quarter showing the lowest level of new dwelling commencements since 2009. Some of that weakness will be offset by continued strength in business investment, particularly engineering construction and infrastructure investment by state governments. And we'll probably do okay on the trade front, given that commodity prices, especially iron ore, are remarkably resilient in the face of the slowdown in China's economy. Unemployment will probably rise a little bit to above 4%, not because there'll be lots of people losing their jobs, but rather because new entrants to the labour market, that's recently arrived migrants, school leavers and university and TAFE graduates, will probably take longer to find jobs than they have done over the past couple of years. The good news will be that inflation should continue to fall. It'll remain too high for the Reserve Bank's comfort, and I think hopes that the Reserve Bank will start cutting interest rates around September are, in my view, misplaced. But inflation will be heading in the right direction. The second half of the year should see some pickup in consumer spending, not least because of the tax cuts that we know are going to come into effect on the 1st of July. The government's rejigged those tax cuts and assuming the legislation gets through the parliament, which isn't absolutely guaranteed, then they'll be rejigged in a way that delivers more to taxpayers on lower and middle incomes who are more likely to spend those tax cuts whilst taking something away from the tax cuts that higher income earners would have got, bearing in mind that higher income earners inevitably would have and will save some of the tax cuts that they're still going to get. So that should see some pickup in consumer spending. We'll probably also see some improvement in the global economy in the second half of the year, which might flow through into our exports. So I think it's best to think of 2024 as being a year of two halves. The first half being pretty tough for households, but some light on the on the horizon for the second half of the year. Where do you see inflation hitting? I think it's going to continue to come down. We'll get an update, of course, on the 31st of January with the uh, December quarter inflation data. But I think we should see by the end of this year inflation of somewhere about three and a quarter, three and a half percent. That's still above the Reserve Bank's two to three percent target band, of course. And that's one reason why I'm sceptical of 
assertions and current market pricing that the Reserve Bank will be cutting interest rates in the second half of this year. After all, the tax cuts that are going to come on the 1st of July are in cash flow terms worth at least two 25 basis point reductions in interest rates to households, albeit to a different set of households from those who will benefit from the tax cuts, but nonetheless in aggregate of similar impact on household cash flows to two reductions in interest rates. So I can't see the Reserve Bank doubling down on that. Other central banks like the US Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Canada, probably the Bank of England, and maybe even the Reserve Bank of New Zealand could be cutting interest rates in the second half of this year. But two things to remember about that before assuming that the Reserve Bank of Australia is going to follow suit. One is that inflation is coming down more quickly in those countries. And for example, the Federal Reserve's preferred measure of core inflation rose at an annual rate of 2% that is in line with its target over the last six months of 2023. So they're well on the way to winning their battle against inflation. The second thing to note is, of course, that all those other central banks raised their interest rates by considerably more than the Reserve Bank of Australia did. My sense, although the Reserve Bank hasn't said this explicitly, is that they are willing to tolerate inflation being above their slightly softer inflation target for longer than their peer central banks in other countries are willing to tolerate inflation being above their targets in order to preserve as much as they can of the gains that have been made in reducing unemployment and underemployment over the last two or three years. The corollary of that and the fact that they haven't raised rates as much as their peers in other comparable countries is I think that they will be slower to start cutting rates than their peers in other comparable countries. What about wages? Well, wages growth picked up in 2023 after almost a decade of stagnation. That was partly because of the more than 8% increase in the minimum wage that the Fair Work Commission granted in July, which flowed through to about 20% of the workforce. But it also reflected the tightening of the labour market in recent years and the fact that at least some employers, have actually had to offer wages in order to get people to fill jobs that they'd otherwise had considerable difficulty filling. But with the labour market easing a bit, and that's more evident so far in the decline in hours worked since June last year than it is in rising unemployment, as I say, there haven't been significant job losses so far. And I think, looking forward, rising unemployment is going to be the result more of new entrants to the workforce taking longer to find jobs than it will be of people who've already got jobs losing them. But as the labour market slackens a bit, you'd expect the pace of wages growth to slow a bit too, probably to somewhere between 3 and 3.5% from over 4% at the peak in 2023. And that's what I think we'll see happening in 2024. Which, is, which would make the Reserve Bank happy. Absolutely. I mean, inflation, uh, uh, wages have not been a significant source of inflationary pressure in Australia up to this point, unlike the US or the UK or New Zealand, where they absolutely have been a factor in the rise in inflation in those countries. But here, I don't think that's really true, partly because of the different wage setting arrangements that we have in this country compared with most of our peers overseas. But the Reserve Bank has warned that if productivity growth, which has been abysmal in recent years and was actually negative in 2022-23 financial year, if productivity growth doesn't return to something like its pre-COVID trend, which is not exactly setting the barrier very high, but if it doesn't return to its pre-COVID trend, then even wages growth of 3 to 3.5% three could become a source of inflationary pressure. So the Reserve Bank will be looking at what's happening to wages, but they'll also be paying attention to whether or not productivity growth picks up as they have assumed that it will. Right. I mean, we had in other world events, we had COVID and we had uh, the Ukraine war and that impacted on economies. Now we've got a situation in Gaza where the Houthis are firing missiles and stopping shipping in the Red Sea, and that could cause shortages, which in turn could cause inflation. 
Oh, that, that's absolutely right. And that's probably one of the most significant risks to the general consensus that inflation is going to continue declining in 2024. Uh, there's already evidence that shipping costs have picked up quite significantly as a result of the fact that ships are choosing to go around the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa, rather than running all the risks of uh, that are now associated with going through the Suez Canal and the Red Sea. And we know from the COVID experience that those increases in shipping costs can and will be passed on by importers to end consumers of things like motor vehicles imported from Europe, uh, as an example. And there are broader complications as well, because although most of our imports come from China and therefore don't pass through the Red Sea and aren't being diverted around Africa, a lot of China's uh, imports from Europe, for example, come in containers through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, and they're not coming through, or they're coming through more expensively. And another problem potentially could be, if the situation persists, that there simply isn't the capacity, isn't the number of containers to put on ships to send goods to Australia that we expect to import from China. And you know, that's the sort of supply chain disruption that occurred during COVID that ultimately had consequences for inflation. So it's a risk that definitely needs to be watched. Another risk emanating from the same region, of course, is that if the conflict does broaden, and Iran is clearly trying to make it broaden through its proxies, um, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, um, it's clearly trying to get uh, a broader conflict. That could have consequences for oil prices as well, which would in turn, of course, feed through into higher inflation. So uh, there are risks to the general view that inflation would head downwards and they have to be monitored closely. Well, Saul, that's all quite edifying. And thank you very much for your time. That's a pleasure. So what's happening in the news? Well, Elon Musk's company, formerly known as Twitter and now called X, is making plans to establish a trust and safety centre of excellence in Austin, Texas. The objective is to strengthen the enforcement of content and safety rules on the platform. X intends to hire 100 full-time content moderators for this new centre, with a primary focus on combating child sexual exploitation content. Joe Benarock, X's Head of Business Operations, mentioned that the moderators would also address other rule violations, including hate speech and violent posts. The company did not provide a specific timeline for the centre's operational commencement. Elon Musk, who assumed control of X in October 2022, has faced criticism for scaling back the company's trust and safety policies, such as those related to misinformation in an attempt to emphasise free speech on the platform. The announcement coincides with the upcoming appearance of CEO Linda Yaccarino before the Senate Judiciary Committee to discuss child safety online, along with other tech company CEOs like Meta Platforms Inc., Snap Inc., TikTok and Discord. In Hong Kong, a court has ordered the debt-ridden property giant Evergrande to undergo liquidation. The decision delivered by Judge Linda Chan comes after Evergrande failed to present a restructuring proposal. Evergrande, grappling with over $325 billion in liabilities, has been a symbol of China's real estate crisis. Its default two years ago had significant repercussions on global financial markets. The court's ruling is anticipated to have profound effects on China's financial markets. Given that the country's property sector contributes around a quarter of the world's second largest economy, now, a recent study conducted by human resources software company Workday reveals that almost two-thirds of Australians express distrust in artificial intelligence or AI. The survey, encompassing nearly 1,300 business leaders and 4,000 employees across 15 countries, highlights Australian scepticism about the rapid adoption of AI technology. 60% of Australians are concerned about the trustworthiness of AI, the highest level recorded among the surveyed countries. Additionally, 55% of Australian employers emphasise the importance of employers considering the broader workforce's impact when implementing AI systems. This sentiment aligns with a growing need for tighter rules on AI deployment, with legal battles emerging, such as New York Times suing Microsoft and GPT maker OpenAI, for alleged unauthorised use of articles in AI model training. Now, the Albanese government in Australia released an interim response to the safe and responsible use of AI, opting for a regulatory approach that clarifies and strengthens existing laws rather than introducing new ones. The government aims to balance the need for regulation with fostering AI-driven economic growth, anticipating an injection 
of $600 billion per year into the national economy by the end of a decade. This strategy mirrors a cautious approach of the United States, which is wary of ceding its competitive advantage to China in the AI sector. Now, bankers from Nine Entertainment have engaged major private equity firms to assess their interest in Nine's controlling stake in domain, an ASX listed property sales platform valued at over $2 billion. Nine currently owns 60% of the domain, and discussions with firms like KKR and TPG have explored potential deals related to domain. The challenge for Nine lies in ways to maximise returns on its major investment in domain, given the platform's performance has not matched that its competitor, REA Group, which is 61% owned by News Corporation. And Ken Henry, the architect of Australia's last major tax reform push, has urged political leaders to revive the national reform agenda. Henry emphasises that significant change is possible with courage, creativity and political persistence, while Treasurer Jim Chalmers has indicated a pause in further tax reforms after adjusting the government's plan to stage three tax cuts. Henry argues that reform remains achievable with determination. He points to the success of past reforms, such as the Keating government's microeconomic reforms and the Howard government's implementation of the GST. And former Labor Climate Change Minister Greg Combay has been appointed chairman of the Future Fund by Treasurer Jim Chalmers. Combay, who also serves as chairman of the Net Zero Economy Agency, replaces former Liberal Treasurer Peter Costello. The Future Fund, established in 2006 to address unfunded superannuation obligations, manages the nation's $270 billion sovereign wealth fund. Combay has publicly supported using retirement savings to fund the energy transition, providing a commensurate return on investment. And experts believe that the federal government's overhauled statutory tax cuts align better with tax design principles and could relieve pressure on families disproportionately affected by the cost of living crisis. Creditor Watch CEO Patrick Coughlin expresses confidence in the revised plan's positive impacts on business and the economy. However, concerns about potential inflationary impacts remain, and it is acknowledged that the original tax cuts heavily favoured higher income earners. The updated plan aims to benefit middle-income Australians by reducing the lowest and second rates while raising the top tax brackets. And the PwC's tax scandal continues to be a concern for the Australian Government, with Assistant Treasurer Stephen Jones stating that reforms in response to the scandal are ongoing. Jones emphasises the need to address issues with the big four audit firms and tackle freelancing, taxation, accountants, engage in illegal tax minimisation. The Government's response to the scandal includes increased penalties for exploiting tax loopholes and empowering regulators. Jones urges PwC to be more transparent by releasing the results of its internal investigation into the scandal. And the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the NDIS, in Australia is projected to exceed $125 billion annually by 2034, according to a government actuary's analysis. This estimate is nearly a third higher than the $95 billion target set in the May budget, indicating that the scheme's costs may have been underestimated. The NDIS, currently supporting over 610,000 people, is expected to cost $42 billion in the current financial year. The challenge for the government is to control the annual growth of the scheme from 11% to 8% by mid-2026, a task complicated by the increasing number of participants, especially children, with developmental challenges. A supermarket giant Woolworths says its New Zealand grocery and Big W discount businesses are trading softer than anticipated, offset at the group level by a solid result from Australian supermarkets and food distribution. Woolworths will take a $209 million loss on its shareholding in Endeavour Group, the parent of Dan Murphy's liquor chain. In a trading update on Monday, Woolworths said its NZ food unit has continued to be challenging. After reviewing the segment's forecast for the next three years, Woolworths will book a non-cash impairment of $1.6 billion New Zealand dollars, that's $1.5 billion Aussie, against the current $2.3 billion New Zealand dollars of goodwill on its balance sheet for the results. Woolworths' first half of 2023-24 earnings before interest and tax are expected to be $71 million New Zealand dollars, 42% below the prior year, including approximately $13 million New Zealand dollars of costs associated with the reinventing the business. Big W's first half EBIT is expected to be materially below 2002 to 23, but the financial performances of Woolworths Australian food arm, including Woolworths Supermarkets and Woolies X, and its distribution arm have remained solid. Woolworths Group unaudited 
EBIT before significant item for the first half of 2024 expected to be $1.682 billion to $1.699 billion, which represents EBIT growth before significant items in the range of 2.8% to 3.8%, it said. In 2022-23, it earned $1.637 billion. EMP Capital Analysts said the forecast EBIT was in line with expectations. However, the broker noted New Zealand was weaker and the impairment charges that had been taken. The growth in Australian profits comes after Prime Minister Anthony Albanese announced the Australian Competition Consumer Commission would investigate allegations of price gouging in supermarkets. Goldman Sachs analyst Lisa Deng said supermarkets would continue to board growth as cost of living pressures forced people to cook more. And the nation's top supermarkets, Woolworths and Coles, could undershoot profit expectations over the next two years as the sector faces an uncertain outlook amid heightened regulatory and political scrutiny that is threatening to place a downward pressure on grocery prices and squeeze profit margins. The political pressure from the six grocery price inquiries, including one led by the Australian Competition Consumer Commission, is likely to add to the noise around high grocery prices, which could in turn force the supermarkets to further cut shelf prices at the cost of profitability. Indeed, 2023 could have seen the peak for supermarket margins. A slowdown in food inflation will also play a part, with cheaper food and grocery prices good for consumers, but at the same time giving little space to move to grow profits for the chains. In a fresh report on the sector from investment bank JP Morgan, analyst Brian Raymond has warned clients of the investment bank that he continues to see downside risks to consensus for earnings forecasts, mainly in fiscal 2025, where he is penciled in earnings per share that is 4.7% and 7.5% below consensus for Woolworths and Coles, respectively. The political firestorm now raging around supermarkets fueled by attacks from politicians over allegations of price gouging and the focus of a string of public inquiries has placed a spotlight on Woolworths and Coles, the prices they charge and the profits they make. Add in the weight of rising costs such as wages and utility bills and supermarket profits are under pressure. Mr Raymond, has profit margins for both supermarket heavyweights sliding between now and fiscal 2025. We forecast Woolworths EBIT margins contract from 6% in fiscal 2023 to 5.9% in 2024 and 5.8% in 2025. Coles is stepping down from 4.8% in fiscal 2023 to 4.6% in fiscal 2024 and 4.5% in fiscal 2025. Mr. Raymond said. Mr. Raymond argues that industry sales growth is set to slow to 3.5% in 2024 from current levels of 3.8% in November 2023 and maintain the range of 3 to 3.5% in the outer months as food disinflation the temporary slowdown in prices and lack of offsetting mechanism through pricing is unlikely given the current regulatory scrutiny. Both supermarkets will report their first half results next month, with companies' profit margins and profits to be dissected by investors who are looking to maximise their returns, who are politicians and members of the Albanese government looking to score political points by attacking the chains. And Australia's retail sales suffered a sharp decline in December, more than reversing a bump recorded in November from Black Friday as households continue to face cost of living pressures. Data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics released on Tuesday shows total retail turnover fell 2.7% in December compared to 1.7% that markets had expected prior to the release of official data. November growth was revised down from 2.2% to 1.6%, which the ABS said revision to seasonally adjusted data were larger than usual, reflecting improvements in the data as the evolving seasonal pattern becomes clearer. ABS Head of Retail Statistics Ben Dorber said the large fall in retail turnover in December was caused by a fall in discretionary spending as shoppers shifted forward much of their Christmas spending in November because of Black Friday. This shifting spending from December to November reflects the growing popularity of Black Friday sales and the impact of cost of living pressures with consumers seeking out bargains and taking advantage of discounts in November, he said. Total monthly turnover was $35.19 billion seasonally adjusted in December, compared to $36.15 billion in the previous month. Turnover fell in all the non-food industries that have been boosted by Black Friday sales in November. Household goods retailing, minus 8.5%, had the largest fall, following the largest rise last month. The next biggest strap were in department stores, minus 8.1%, clothing, footwear and personal accessory retailing, minus 5.7%, and other retailing, minus 1.1%. Food-related industries, turnover fell in cafes, restaurants and takeaway food, minus 1.1%. While food retailing, 0.1%, was the only industry to rise. Retail turnover fell across the country, with large falls in all states and territories, 
the majority down by more than 2%. And climate-conscious investors, frustrated by the spray and pray approach of traditional ventures, are tipping money into a new $200 million climate-focused fund managed by the team behind Clean Energy Finance Corporation's early venture foray. Virescent Ventures has already committed more than $260 million to climate-specific tech startups over the last six years, but is now trying to leverage the growing number of family offices and companies scrambling to gain exposure to technologies that might shift the dial on the global energy transition. Unlike broader software-as-a-service startup valuations, Climate tech didn't soar as high during the period of ultra-low interest rates and has therefore managed to withstand the recent pullback in valuations. Virescent Ventures says this has completed 16 following investments, totaling around $93 million in the last two years. The new fund, which Virescent hopes will back $200 million, will extend the strategy of targeting decarbonisation technologies across transport, electricity, food and agriculture, enabling technologies such as the Internet of Things and, and grid management. Green hydrogen, the circular economy and resource sector are also targets. Virescent Ventures said it performed above a 19.5% internal rate of return benchmark released by Cambridge Associates. This benchmark was measured between 2015 and 2021. Investors also refuse to say how much of a new $200 million fund has been secured so far. The fund will be managed by three investors. Ms Vaughan cut her teeth as an investor at Champ Ventures. Her chemical engineering back meant that she sifted through deals like underground coal mining mastermind play that listed in 2010. Blair Pritchard, a partner of Virescent, built an understanding of alternative assets at Macquarie Bank where he said he became completely obsessed with the climate space. After the GFC, money was tough to find, so he focused on making seed investments, including cattle, sex selection, tech play, and gender. Mr Pritchard said there are opportunities for investment in regulatory technology. Managing partner Ben Gust, meanwhile, built a career in healthcare ventures at GBS Venture Partners, which was a management buyout of the Rothschild Healthcare Venture Fund. Throughout the 1990s and 2000s, superannuation money formed the basis of venture funds and also backed the likes of Blackbird Ventures, Airtree Ventures and Square Pegs. But they are not the driving force behind Virocent. And beloved frozen desserts brand Sarah Lee has been rescued out of administration by former race car driver Carl Clark Quinn and his partner Brooke, the same pair who saved chocolate maker Daryl Lee in 2012. The sale of the business, some of which was not disclosed, also ensures the employment of more than 200 staff, whom Administrator Vaughan Strawbridge said had rallied behind the business during the process. Australians rushed to supermarkets to buy Sarah Lee's frozen cheesecakes, pies, crumbles and ice creams last October, after higher operating costs, supply chain issues and disrupted operations saw the company collapse and appoint FTI Consulting as administrators of the business. Sarah Lee's opera, Australian operations were established in 1971 and became a household name synonymous with good quality and affordable frozen desserts. Clark and Brooke Quinn emerged as also successful buyers in a competitive sales process involving around 60 domestic and international parties interested in taking on the brand, as well as some 55 million owed to creditors, including employees, unpaid suppliers and secured lenders. We're a small Aussie family that shared in the tradition of having Sarah Lee apple pie and vanilla ice cream every Sunday night at the dinner table and could not be more proud to put Aussie-made and owned stamp on the Sarah Lee.